or at least close your mouth. Hello, everybody. Welcome to the June chapter meeting of the Tennessee Valley chapter here of the Adirondack Mountain Club. I am Dave Nichols. I'm the chair for this year. I'm glad you could all come. We're going to start out with a few announcements. They'll be short and quick, and then we'll get into the program. So, first up, uh, looks like Rich, are you doing an announcement? Just a quick announcement about Expo. Uh, it's this Saturday. There are flyers out there. If you have a friend that has never been to an Expo that you think should be there, grab a flyer and give it to them. I appreciate that. Also, uh, and I think we probably already asked 95% of you, if you have a kayak that you're willing to let people test drive out there, please feel free to bring it. We can use that. Thank you. Thanks, Rich. Reinhardt. I'm Reinhard Salmeyer, and I just want to let you folks know I'm leading an introduction to backpacking trip. It's going to be the last weekend in July. It'll be a fairly easy three-day, two-night backpack. We're doing a section of the Northville Placid Trail. So if anybody, you know, is interested in, you know, uh, getting into backpacking or wanting to get a little more backpacking experience, uh, this will be a good trip for you. I still have uh, two openings. Uh, for this trip. Uh, the deadline to sign up is the end of June, okay? My, my contact information and everything is in the Genesee and it's also on uh, GBC calendar. So if you're interested, uh, please give me a shout. Thank you. Thanks, Ryder. Jill? Hello, I'd like to invite you all to a social for the Genesee Valley chapter in July. This was planned after the June Genesean came out, so you'll have to check online to, to see details, but I think we'll probably be sending an email blast too. This will be the second Wednesday night in July, which is like our meeting time, okay? But since we don't meet in the summer, and we thought we would meet at Seven Story Brewing Company on Route 96 in Bushnell's Basin. The details will be on the calendar, but we uh, just thought we would meet up. People can buy a beer. If you would like to uh, get pizza that night, you can put in five bucks and we'll order some pizza from Pontillo's across the street. And we can visit, have a beer, and catch up during the summer. So look into, look on the calendar for further information. Okay, thank you. Thanks, Jill. Bill? And, and for even more sociability, uh, we're going to repeat the uh, picnic that we had last year. How many people came to the picnic last year? Folks had a good time? Yes. Okay, good. So we're going we're gonna to repeat that potluck uh, picnic. And that will be Wednesday, August 10th. It's already up on the calendar. There aren't many details at this point. Uh, but just wanted to give you a heads up. And maybe you can enter it into your own calendars. And, Save the day. Uh, great opportunity to just get together with people, have a chance to uh, chat. Uh, we're going to be doing it at the same location in Menden Ponds Park again, uh, right by 100 Acre Pond. So if you'd like, bring your boat and go for a paddle too as, uh, as part of that. So Wednesday, August 10th. Thanks, Bill. Uh, let's see, I have one announcement. Um, we have one opening for a family chair. Todd Williams has done an excellent job of leading a bunch of hikes and activities for families over the last year. Uh, he's moving to Maine, and so we're going to lose him. But he's started a great program. If you would like to lead and continue that program, please see me, and I'd be happy to share the information. Uh, Jackson? Guide for the Montezuma Wetlands Complex for 
additional information, detailed information on the reverse study. So this is available at the bookstore table after tonight's program. Thank you. One dollar. Thanks, Jackson. You're welcome, Dave. So tonight is member night. We have three members who are telling about their recent adventures uh, exploring various parts of, of the U.S. Uh, since they've all been pretty active and you've seen them up here already, in fact, <laughs> except for Luke, uh, they don't need much of an introduction. But we'll start out with Luke Nelson. Luke, I'll just let you go right at it. Thanks, Dave. Uh, if, if you're having trouble hearing me, just let me know. I know Joe will let me know, so don't hesitate to just yell out. Uh, this, this trip here, I'm just going to describe a little bit of time I spent in the late winter down in Florida. I'll show a bunch of photos a little bit, but I'll just give you some information first. Uh, so I did uh, a lot of hiking down there, although it's really more walking than anything else. I'll show you where that is, it included two trips to the Everglades. It took over 1,100 photos, and I'll show a few of those tonight. Uh, I try not to duplicate bird photos. Uh, I will call out what each photo is in terms of type when I go through those. Most of the places I hiked were close to where we were within 45 minutes, with the exceptions of two trips to the Everglades that were over two hours. And if I could ask if you could save your questions for the end, because we're trying to get three presentations in tonight. Yes, Katie. <laughs> Thank you, Katie. Okay, so I was based here. Stero is between Fort Myers and Naples. As you can see, Florida is a very big state. Now, in Florida, there is really an abundance of parks, wildlife refuges, uh, Within half an hour to an hour's drive, there's a lot of them. And most of Florida is like that, so keep that in mind. You'll see um, the dates and where I went. Community Park, State Park, National Park, National Wildlife Refuge, State Park, uh, and Audubon, Swamp Sanctuary, another State Park, and the Rookery Swamp Trail here. So there's an abundance of different places to hike. Uh, in terms of physical locations, again, they were all very, very close, with the exception of the Everglades down here. Uh, this is on Sanibel Island when I went to uh, the National Wildlife Refuge called Ding Darling. Uh, over here was the two uh, corkscrew swamp sanctuary and then the, um, uh, the bird rookery over here. These were amazing places. If I go down again, I'm going to both of those again. These places over here were really nice, uh, but they were not as, as big or, or abundant with wildlife and birds as the other ones. Uh, I did identify every bird uh, and wildlife species. It took a lot of time and I needed a lot of help. So I did use some different uh, sources of information. Most of the places I went to had very good signage brochures. I actually have a few up here if people want to look at them later. I used three applications to identify birds and wildlife. The Merlin Bird ID is extremely good. Some of the wildlife I didn't know, I used iNaturalist. And I had a few plants, a couple of flowers you'll see. I used picture this to identify those. Um, if you're ever down there, just make sure you always have your camera with you, uh, unless you're just comfortable using your phone. So, People ask me, well, what do you suggest for down there? Uh, everywhere I went, I asked people uh, where I should be going because I was completely clueless on where to go. And I got the, the suggestion, I was walking back from one state park, somebody saw me in the camera and they said, you should go over to Ding Darling. At Ding Darling, somebody told me I should go to the Swamp Sanctuary. The Swamp, Swamp Sanctuary, they told me I should go to the river. So that turned out very, very good. And every time I went someplace, it kept getting better. Um, if you look up maps of, say, Florida for all the National Wildlife Refuges, those state parks, it's incredibly abundant compared to a lot of other states. Um, the pamphlets I mentioned are very, very useful, especially at the bigger places. Um, I did download a bunch of all trails maps prior to going down for local hikes. 
then once I found another place that someone mentioned, I would pull down and use those just to get an idea of where to go. I did join a hiking club down there, and I was in a period of time I was down there that was very, very helpful, and I got a lot of uh, useful tips on the places to go. Um, is it walking or hiking? I call it nature walking. Um, I hiked over 50 miles and 200 feet of elevation gain, so you get the idea. Um, things I'd recommend that you bring, always a camera. Like, uh, I, I, a couple trips I had to remember to bring my binoculars. On some hikes, I did not. Uh, but I did have my big camera, so I was able to zoom in most of the time. All the other things are just pretty much common sense. I really, I always had long sleeve shirts and pants on, even though some, some days I probably didn't need that, but I did it for bug protection. But when I was down there in the wintertime, the bugs were never bad. Uh, if you go down in obviously the summer or, or later spring, you definitely will need that. You don't need hiking poles and you don't need strong hiking boots for the kind of walking that you'll do down there. How is it different? Temperatures, obviously. Uh, I was down there during the end of the winter season, which is a phenomenal time to go. Uh, the, the rangers at Everglades told me winter is the busy season. Everything is much drier. You don't get those afternoon showers every day. The abundance of, of birds, especially around water, is just always amazing. Uh, some of the places, you'll see pictures of this that I went to, especially the bird rookery, you're literally like at a zoo and you're, you're inside the fence because alligators are right there. I mean, you're really right, right, you're right off the trail and you'll see that. What types of wildlife? Obviously the biggest thing is, is tons and tons of birds and mostly big birds, although I'll show examples of small little birds tonight. These are, are some of the things that I saw. Uh, some things you may see if you go down there that I didn't see. Uh, I didn't see a Florida panther, although they, they had one at one of the places I was at. I didn't see wild hogs or bears or bobcats or coyotes, but there's, there's a little bit of everything in Florida. Gator notes. So there's a lot of myths about gators down there. You just have to be aware of it. I don't consider it dangerous. It's just you always hear these rumors about running a zigzag, but the experts say that's, that's not true. You're better off running in a straight line, just as fast as you can. Uh, but the alligators lose their stamina very, very quickly also on land. Um, on some of the trails I was on, there's all kinds of signage about not to bring dogs. If you got kids, they got to be really close because you can't afford them to run ahead on some of these trails. Uh, just be on alert. You don't wear headphones, things like that, because you want to make sure you're keeping your eyes open all the time and you're listening for sounds. Um, I, every hike I did, I did solo. Uh, not, not always by choice, but I did want to maximize what I was going to see. And if you want to see the most amount of wildlife, I recommend you doing a solo or going with people who have similar interests so that I'm making a lot of noise. Um, the one, the last hike I did, 12 mile hike, I easily saw 150, over 150 alligators, some of them very, very close to the trail. Okay? Jump to photos. the moisture off their wing. 
weeks, so they air out, basically. Um, the only way the bird down I saw that looks like this and does that is the double cormorant, and you'll see a photo of that. This is a, I like these group photos. So we've got a wood stork, we've got a bunch of Muscovy ducks, and these two here are model ducks. This is right behind where it was. This is a gopher tortoise. I actually saw several of these. They, they burrow underground. This is pretty big. You'll see in the next picture. And they actually have very nice coloration. It just seems to always be covered by sand. Um, but I saw these in a bunch of places, and some of them right next to the trail. This is, I can't remember, I have the cheek here. Loggerhead Shrike. I saw this in the Everglades. It's taken from a long ways away, so the quality of photo is not very good. Um, this is a common galanul. I don't know if I'm pronouncing that right. This is a fish crow. The only reason I included it is because if you look at this, it's almost like there was some kind of damage there somehow. It was, I never realized it when I took the photo until I loaded it up on my see and saw that. Uh, these are the double-breasted cormorants. Again, what I hear is, is drawing out the wings. Katie? Do you believe in spell games? No? Well, I saw one, Katie. Okay. So now, now I don't believe in Bigfoot, but spell games, maybe. Uh, this is a little blue heron. One of the things I learned down there is there more types of herons than I ever realized. And I, I got some good photos of some of them, not all of them, but that was very educational. It's the great blue heron. This is a cattle egret. This is a purple gullinool. This is a, I think that's a tricolor heron. Yeah, that's a tricolor heron. So this is in the Everglades. I was just taking pictures of this wood stork, and it took off flying up the pathway towards these people, who obviously thought it was great. Uh, but it just goes to show you how close you are to these types of birds and the wildlife down there. Uh, this is a Lasagras flycatcher. Uh, this is a Cooter's turtle. Nothing fantastic about that, but I included it because what they like to do is reach up and eat the yellow flowers like this. And, and you see them doing that quite a bit. It's pretty cool. This is also in the Everglades. This is a, when I was sleeping out here, it looks, that's what it looks like. That's right off the pathway in the Everglades, one of many I saw. So we took an airboat ride. Um, Please note that this is my brother, sister, and law, their son, this is my son. Please notice the only person not smiling in that photo. <laughs> but we'll progress from that. Uh, I quoted this, hopefully I can get this to work. If this, I have two little short videos of the airboat ride. If you've never been on one, they're pretty cool. Um, they're probably going to run in succession, so just be aware of that. Snapping turtle was right on the hole, 
That was interesting, but on this very same hole, I saw the biggest lizard I've ever seen in my life. And, and which I thought was very nice because it was a beautiful lizard. It's because of the sun, it, it bleaches out the colors, but it was really beautiful. And I had no idea what it was. And I was at Ding Darling National Wildlife Refuge the following day, and I showed the naturalist the photo. And he immediately recognized it. He said, this is not a native species. Um, and I, I couldn't identify with the different applications exactly what type of lizard it is. But it just goes to show you, you can see things anywhere down there. Uh, this is a tricolored heron. I show this because of the size of the belly. Um, I don't know who or what it just ate, but that animal, that crop, that alligator is definitely sitting there digesting because that was the fattest belly I saw in an alligator. This is this is a banded orb weaver spider. It was taken from a long ways away, and I had no idea what would really come up. But when I brought up the PC look at it, the markings and, and the colorings were very, very interesting, at least I thought so. Uh, an example of the signage, this was at Ding Darling. Uh, I did see a lot of these birds, a couple of notes. Uh, the largest bird at that refuge, again, this is on Sanibel Island, was the white pelican, which I had never really seen or heard of before. Fortunately, they were at the end of their migration, they migrate north, but there was some on site. And I'll show some pictures of those. And they're very big birds. One bird I did not see over here, it's hard to tell. It's called a rosate spoonbill, very colorful bird. I was really hoping to see one and I did not. I actually have this flyer with me tonight if you want to look at it later. This is a mangrove buckeye. This is a white ibis. This, this is a green heron. And I saw these guys at a lot of places and they were always doing this. They were right next to the water, hunting and waiting. And they were really intimidating looking. These are white pelicans. Now, one area I was hiking in, there are areas of Florida where they do a lot of prescribed birds. And at this particular place I went to, which was very, very dry, there was different signage, and some of them had much more frequent cycles of prescribed birds. But it really is used pretty effectively in Florida. I just liked the, the little buggy here on the, the iris. This is a green anole. You see lots of these little wizards in Florida and other places. This is a brown anole. This is a water moccasin. Um, first time I ever saw one of those. This is a great egret. This is a juvenile light ibis. Like it's not confusing enough trying to figure out the juveniles. This is Spiny shell, soft shell turtle. A couple of gators. Now this guy, I quoted it. This is another cooters, cooters turtle. I didn't notice till I put up the damage on the shell. So I'm, I'm guessing I'm attacked by something, but I don't really know. This was an interesting bird. This is a black crowned night heron, and. When I was um, at the Audubon facility, which was a two and a quarter mile boardwalk through swamps, it was really cool. And uh, I was talking to this one couple because they knew the area very well. They were bird experts. He had his binoculars. I had forgotten mine that day. And they saw me taking a lot of pictures with my big camera. And he called me over. He said, look over here and zoom in, and that's the only reason why I saw this. But that's another one of those, those like more obscure herons. I was very surprised to see in that swamp, 
a bunch of raccoons in between the snakes, the alligators, who knows what else, the bobcats, the Florida panthers. But there was a bunch of them in there during the middle of the day. This is a juvenile yellow crown heron. Uh, when I started, this is where the boardwalk was at, at the uh, Audubon facility. When I started my day here, this was empty. And when I got done, people put their, their uh, sightings up here. I did see most of these. Not all of them, but most of them. Again, I didn't see this. <laughs> so it was well. Uh, this is another brown and all. Now, I quoted this because I always have won, I like butterflies, and I was wondering the difference between a uh, monarch and viceroy. This is a monarch. I'll show a viceroy later, and I think I finally figured out one of the differences, and it has to do with this section and pattern over here. Yes? Twenty. Okay, thank you. Um, this is a red, uh, red bellied woodpecker. Uh, sharing the trail with alligators, absolutely lots of signage for that. Um, this is a zebra long wing of an alligator. This is a black vulture. Give some perspective. 
That's my wife and oldest daughter over there. It was pretty amazing. And they wanted to develop a American source of rubber. They tried all kinds of trees to get a productive source of rubber. They never really succeeded. Banyan was one of their experiments. Uh, we took a boat ride towards the end. We're going by a dock. This dog was barking at the water like crazy. And we noticed a dolphin very close. The owner of the dog home came out. She saw us look and she says, you, it's the craziest thing. The dog goes out every day and barks at the dolphin. And the dolphin keeps circling every day because it loves the interaction with, with the dog. It was hysterical. Uh, the last photo, this is just a brown pelican. I would just really like it. When you see them up close, there's a lot more coloration. This one actually was more yellow than it came out the photo. But that's it.